So this morning we're going to start chapter 14 and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7. 1 through 7. Remember that this is really the story of how that the church got started. It's the, it's the story of the good times, the story of the hard times, and the story of the tragic times. God really hides absolutely nothing from us. And that's one of the things that's amazing about this book because he wants to equip us as the body of Christ to be able to face anything, no matter what it is, in this life and in our ministry and in, in his kingdom and the things that we do for him. So Paul and Barnabas are on their first missionary journey. We've been seeing quite a journey at that, right? They started out in Antioch, and they went to Seleucia, then to Cyprus, then they went to Salamis, and whenever they went to Salamis, they began to preach the gospel. Then they traveled to Paphos, where they encountered Bar-Jesus. You remember that? The false teacher who tried to stop them from spreading the gospel, who tried to stop them from evangelizing the governor of that region. Then after that, they set out to Pamphylia, where one of their own abandoned them, John Mark. And also we saw maybe some sickness enter in with Paul during that time. And then from there, they set out to Poseidon Antioch, where Paul preached his first recorded sermon that we have, that we've been going through very carefully and closely for the last few weeks. But if you remember, they got ran out of town. <laughs> after his message, they got ran out of town, and so they just dusted the dust off of their feet, and they went on to Iconium. And this is where we pick up in chapter 14. So please stand for the reading of God's Word. 14, starting in 1. In Iconium they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks, but the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. Therefore they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord who was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they become aware of it and fled to the cities of Laconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding regions. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so grateful to be able to gather together as your people as the body of Christ, to come before you, to worship you, to get to know you in a better way. It's such an honor and a privilege to do that. God, I pray that you would help us to understand your word this morning. I pray that you apply it to our lives through your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would help us to have greater gratitude, greater appreciation toward you, toward what it is that you've done for us. You've done so much, God, that it takes a lifetime to even comprehend and God, I just pray that, that you help us to glorify you in this message and in, in this day on Sunday and, in, and not just today, but tomorrow, the rest of the week and the rest of our lives, God. Help us to appreciate you, to glorify you, to love you in a greater way. We are so thankful for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want, I want to look at 2 Corinthians real quick. This isn't in, in, in my notes, Nikki, so it's not going to be on the screen. So 2 Corinthians 5.14. If you have your Bibles, flip over there real quick. Keep your finger um, here in Acts, but because I just want to read seven words to you. Just seven words in 2 Corinthians 5.14. And I think these are, are such important words, especially to see the heart of Paul and Barnabas and what's going on here. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. Let me read these se just seven words to you and underline them if you, if you have a pen. It says, For the love of Christ controls us. Let that sink in for a minute. Just let the Holy Spirit work. And how is that applied, right? How 
do we apply this? There's other versions that say that he compels us, right? For the love of Christ compels us. There's so many things to that. That's, this is one of the things that if we, if we could tattoo that on our eyelids and glow in, in the dark ink, and when we close our eyes at night, we could see that. Because, you know, it says here that the love of, of Christ, not the love for Christ, right? Because we know that our love for Christ wavers. It's different from day to day. Sometimes we have amazing love for Christ, and we want to do great things for Him. And other days, it's hard and it's difficult. But that what, what controls us? What compels us to press on when things get hard? What, whenever the difficult times hit, what compels us? What controls us to go out and, and to continue fighting, to continue loving, to continue being the parents that we are, the grandparents that we are, the teachers, the preachers, the Christians? What compels us? Is it us or is it Him? It's His love. Whenever we can really understand the love of God and what He has toward us, then it empowers us to want to go out and to do things for Him, to want to glorify Him in all things. This is an absolute amazing seven words. And I, I think that these things should be underlined and really be the anthem for our life. It's God's love for us. That's what compels us to come to church on Sunday. That's what compels us to want to pray when things are hard, whenever our children say something difficult to us or makes us feel bad, whenever it seems like chaos is going on in the government, right, and in the world, and we turn on the news and it seems so tragic. Sometimes we want to crawl within ourselves, but what, what helps us to propel, to keep moving forward, to go on and press on and to continue fighting in this battle? And it is a battle, no doubt. It's because we know and we understand that the creator of this world, he loves us. He loves us. We are loved by God. And that's what helps us to, to continue to carry on, right? And that's what we see here in our text because we can see that Paul and Barnabas has been ran out of town they tried to stone them many times it seems like everywhere they went they were being met by resistance by opposition but they pressed on because they understood these seven words right they understood these seven words so this text is really talking about a missionary effort a missionary Effort. Did you know that the word missionary is not in the scriptures? It's actually not in the Bible. But the concept is. The concept of being a missionary is. So what we should understand is there's no distinction between being a disciple and being what we call today a missionary. You know, we, we make these little categories. We like to put things in boxes, right? We have teaching and preaching and we have missionaries and we have all these boxes we like to put things in. But there's really no difference. And I bring this up because it's important that we should understand that every person in this room is a missionary. We're all disciples. We're all missionaries. There's no difference in a missionary in another country than what we are here on the Western Slope. You are all missionaries. If you are a Christian, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ because God has given every single person in this room the Great Commission to want to go out and to preach the gospel and proclaim God, to proclaim Christ anywhere we go, right? We are all missionaries, and we should support missionaries in foreign countries. We should pray for them. We should spend a, a lot of time with God on our knees praying for people because it's very difficult in other countries and the, with these missionaries, but we also have to understand that we are also missionaries, right? We've been given a mission to go and proclaim the word of God to anyone who will listen to us. And Paul and Barnabas is a prime example of that here. And something that we should note, in this area that we're dealing with in our text, it's talking about the area of Galatia. I think that's important for later on, whenever you read the book of Galatians, you can kind of get an idea of how these churches got started, right? They were met by great opposition. They even got ran out of town. We're going to see some things in our text this morning. But years later, Paul would be writing a letter to the churches of Galatia. 
And that's how that this got started. Let's look at verse 1. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. So Paul and Barnabas have a pattern, don't they? We've been seeing this pattern over and over again. They like to go to cities, and they like to go into the synagogue and to preach. That's because they had great opportunity to share the gospel there. You already had people gathered together wanting to learn about the Bible, right? They wanted to learn about the Old Testament. So it was an amazing opportunity for Paul and Barnabas to go in. You already have people's ears, and then to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the gospel. There was a great opportunity for them. And that's something we should be praying for, is for God to give us an opportunity to share the gospel with people. That's a prayer that God loves to answer, I can tell you. That's something that should be a part of your daily prayers, is God, please give me someone, anyone, the, an opportunity where, where I can present the gospel to them, to be able to teach them the amazing work of your son, Jesus Christ. Right? It's a it's an amazing thing when God gives us that opportunity, and he will do that if you pray for that. We can also see here that there's a large number of people that were converted. They were converted because of the word of the Lord. And this isn't unique to the apostles, right? Sometimes we think that God would never do that with us or in this church, in our individual lives, but he does. God does that with his people. He will do that for us. We, we can't just think of, of people in church history that, you know, they were great evangelists or, or great preachers, but God would never use us that way because he does. I mean, it's, that's something that should humble us and to help us to carry on this mission of the gospel with people. God loves us, and he wants us to be involved in his work. And he does that just like we would want a young child or our grandchild to be involved in the work that we're doing, even though if it's something that takes us longer to do. We can do things a lot faster without teaching a small child how to do things, but we do that because we love them and because we want them to be involved in our work. And God sees us the exact same way. He uses us in his amazing plan of redemption because he loves us and he blesses us for being faithful to the Great Commission and the other things that we do for his kingdom. And so really what we're talking about here is intimacy. Intimacy. We have intimate relationship with God the Father, with the Trinity, with God the Son, with God the Holy Spirit. There's no other way that we could have intimacy with him, right? That's how the, that he shows us intimacy as he gets us involved in what he's doing, even though he doesn't necessarily need us. But he loves us. He loves us. You see, intimacy isn't just an emotion. It's an involvement. It's an involvement. And we are involved in the Great Commission. We are involved in God's kingdom and doing what it is that he's called us to do. That's one of the ways that we have intimacy with God. You see, God sees us like a four-year-old child who walks into the garage and grabs a wrench and wants to crawl under the car and try to help dad fix something, right? That's the way God sees us. He sees us as that four-year-old child, and he wants us to be involved, even though he may not need us to do that, but he loves us. People are converted by the Holy Spirit because they've heard the word of the Lord from missionaries, from disciples, from pastors, from preachers, from you. Remember that you're a missionary, right? God uses us because we are the ones who've walked into the garage and picked up the wrench. We picked up the wrench, and God wants us to be involved with what he's doing. He does that through his word. He wants us to understand what it is that he's doing, and he's, it's very clear in the scriptures. And he loves to see us be faithful to what he's called us to do, and not, not just that, but to excel at it. Just like we would be excited to see someone, a, a child or a grandchild that we've been teaching to excel in the things that we've been showing them, right? And that's the way God loves to see us to excel in what he's commanded us to do in scripture. But what does it look like? What does it look like to be a missionary or a disciple of Jesus Christ locally? What does it look like to be a missionary on the western slope? Well, first you should understand 
that we should belong to a local church, right? Belonging to a local church. You can't just be a lone wolf, right? Not a, there's no such thing as a lone wolf disciple because we all need one another. Every single person in this room, we're a body of Christ, right? Each person is important. Each person has been given gifts, and we all need each other. God has designed us that way. The, this area that we live in on the western slope, there's this mentality that the church is the mountains, right? And I'm sure you guys hear it. I hear it all the time. You know, that the, I don't need to go to church. I have the mountains, and I feel closer to God when I'm out in the mountains than I do when I come to church with a bunch of people, right? I hear that all the time. You know, the mountains are beautiful, and we should glorify God because of the mountains. But the mountains is not the church, right? This is the church. People gathered together as a body of Christ, each using your gifts for the edification of the church and God's kingdom as being missionaries, as being disciples of Christ, right? That's what the church is. Another way that we should be a missionary is that we need to be fed, we need to be fed, right? We're a part of this local body of Christ, and, that, and the church that we belong to should feed us, not just entertain us, right? That seems to be the theme in the church in, anymore in America, is, you know, I, this, this feeding stuff, you know, I just want to be, enta- I just want to be entertained, right? Give me good music and, and give me a, a comedian behind the pulpit so I can be entertained. But that's not the way that God has designed the church. God's designed the church to be fed, to be fed. But we don't stop there, right? We don't stop there because we also feed ourselves. We feed ourselves when we get home through the week. We study scriptures. We read good Christian books that helps us. That We study theology. We study all of these things to get to know God because we feed ourselves also through the week, right? That's something that's important. Another way to be a missionary is to pray to pray. You know, that's one of the things we've been doing a monthly prayer meeting here at this church. And me and Steve met and talked this week and talked about, you know, one of the things that we should probably really focus on is just teaching people how to pray because it is so vital. It's so important for the health of the church and for the individual and uh, for us to be able to grow in our missionary efforts, right? Because we're all missionaries. Right? We're all missionaries. And it's okay to pray for yourself. I should say that. You should pray for yourself. There's a lot of things that we should be praying for ourselves, right? That God uses us, that God strengthens us, that God helps us to be bold in our faith and to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. I pray that every day for my kids. God, help my kids to, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit. Right? That's it's so, so important for us to do. We should pray for the church. We should pray for leaders, for leaders of the church. Leaders are often the deepest in the fight, and Satan's trying to stop leaders of the church, trying to, to, to keep them down, to depress them. And so we should, we should support our leaders, and we should be praying for them, because it's not easy to be a leader in the church because we're fighting a war. Another way to be a missionary is to work on our sanctification, right? To work on our Christ-likeness, our holiness. And that's part of why I read that scripture at the beginning. What compels you, right? What controls you? It's the love of Christ. It's the love of Christ, right? He comes into us, and we understand He loves us, and that, that makes us want to go out and to do the things that we know is right, the things that we know that He's commanded us to do. Because we know how much He loves us. We know how much that He loves us. That's, a, that's an amazing thing to do. We learn to rely on the Holy Spirit, and we let Him work in our lives, right? We learn from our mistakes, too. We all get out there and we make mistakes, and we learn from those. And we still try to learn how to glorify God. And we learn forgiveness. And we learn how to apologize to one another. That's part of being a body of Christ. Because we want to progress in sanctification. Another way to be a missionary is to use your gifts. To use your gifts. Use your gifts for the edification of the church. God designed us that way. We already talked about being a body of Christ. How that everyone here is needed. God needs us to work together to be united, right? Because that's the way that he designed us. And there's so many ways that we can use our gifts. 
in this church. And God's blessed the church with so many gifts. It's, it's amazing. But what we should do is just make ourselves available, right? Make ourselves available to be put in the fight. Talk to a leader. Talk to an elder. And they'd be glad to show you how to use your gifts. And these are just a few of the ways to be a missionary. Just a few of the ways to be a disciple. But there's countless other ways. These are just some of the basics. And these were the heart of Paul and Barnabas. But it wasn't the heart of the Jews that we see in our text. Let's look at verse 2. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and embittered them against the brethren. So once again, we can see that they ran into opposition. We've talked about opposition a few times, but we need to be reminded of it over and over again. That's why the scripture brings it up over and over again. Because scripture assumes that we're being missionaries and we're doing what God has called us to do. Scripture assumes that we're being disciples and being obedient to the Great Commission. Scripture assumes that because we're being faithful Christians, that we're being met by opposition, just like Paul and Barnabas were being met by opposition. But notice that the Jews who disbelieved the gospel, it says that they stirred up the Gentiles and embittered them against Paul and Barnabas. And that's the way that the world acts toward us, right? That's the way that the act towards that, that's the way that the world acts toward us because the gospel is something that's offensive. Right? It, it, in other religions, it's, it, the, way that, the way of salvation isn't so offensive because you can earn it. You can do it on your own. But the gospel comes along and says you can't do anything. All you can do is believe. You just have faith in Christ. All this work that you're doing to try to earn your salvation is in vain. That's what the gospel says. The gospel says that the only way that we're made right by God is by, is by believing His work, the work that He's done for us on the cross, right? We have faith. That's how we're made right with God. We have faith. We believe. That's something that the world hates, and that's why that we see that people are being stirred up here. Well, what's really bad, though, is whenever we act like that toward one another, and, I, and we've seen that. We've all been part of churches that have acted like this, divisive toward one another. Have you ever been embittered toward another believer? Or has another, or another believer ever been embittered toward you? When we do that, we're acting like the Jews in this text. We're going against what it is that God's doing in, in His church and in His body. And I'm not talking about false teaching. I'm not talking about heresy. That's something that we should be stirred up about. That's something that we should correct, that we should rebuke. But what I'm talking about is, is the petty things that people get so stirred up about in church today that they really shouldn't be upset about. We shouldn't be the source of opposition from within the body of Christ because we have enough opposition from outside the body of Christ. These Jews, were, they weren't a part of the body of, of Christ, however, right? So we shouldn't expect them to act any different. We should expect them to to show opposition to Paul and Barnabas because that's what the world does. And Scripture has thoroughly warned us that there's going to be opposition when we go out and we try to spread the gospel, when we try to be faithful Christians, when we try to be missionaries. Scripture has thoroughly warned us that we'll be met by opposition. And so it, it assumes that we're doing these things, that we are being faithful missionaries. You see, it wasn't easy then. It wasn't an easy life for the believer, but it's not an easy life for the believer today either. Sometimes we fight until we feel tired, we feel worn out, and we come home, we just want to rest. We turn on the news, and then we get the warm fuzzies, right? <laughs> yeah. No, we turn on the news, and we realize things are much worse than what we thought. You know, that's something I, I noticed last night. I was writing the sermon all week long and, and meditating on these things. And last night, I, I, I got on Facebook. It was probably a mistake. And it was all negative stuff, right? The world's ending, World War III, you know, um, Israel's getting attacked. And it was just negative, 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 negative. And I, I said, you know, I need to practice what I'm preaching here because I began to feel sad. I began to feel 
op oppressed and depressed because of all the news that was I was being bomb bombarded with. And that's what happens when we watch the news and things. But what we, should, what we need to do is, is to fall back on what we read, right? God loves us, right? Jesus loves us. That's where we get this, this gumption to go forth and to proclaim the gospel and to keep fighting, to keep doing what it is that God's called us to do, right? Even when things are difficult. Even when we get on social media like I did last night. Let's look at verse 3. It says, Therefore they spent a long time there, speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who was testifying to the word of His grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. I love this. I absolutely love this. From where did Paul and Barnabas get their strength? They relied on the Lord. They relied on the Lord. Paul and Barnabas relied on the Lord, and so should we. You know, we live in America where we're taught that we need to be strong, that we don't need to rely on anything, we don't need to depend on anyone, that we should pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We see strength in the people who came before us, and we want to be like them. Right? But Scripture doesn't teach that. Scripture doesn't teach us to rely on ourselves, to be strong within ourselves, but to be de dependent. To be dependent. To rely on the Lord. That's what Scripture teaches us. To be dependent and rely on God. To understand that we are weak and that God is strong. Christian, you don't have to be strong on your own. You should... You should feel relief in that, right? You don't have to be strong on your own. You don't have to muster up grit when things get hard. Some people spend their entire lives and never understand that lesson because everyone and everything around us teaches us that you should be strong. And if you're not strong, then you need to toughen up, right? That's what the world cries out. It says that weakness is something that you should kill, right? And dependency is something that you have counselors for. But Christian, I can tell you, you can rest. And when I say rest, I don't mean stop fighting. When I say rest, I mean rest in Him. Rest in Jesus. Rest in Christ. You see, you fight. You minister. You go to battle. But you don't do it on your own strength. You don't do it with your own grit. You fall on the strength of your Savior, of your God, of Jesus Christ. And He's the one that gives you the strength to press on. In fact, Scripture wants us to understand that we're not strong, that we're weak. And when we, when we understand that, then God can use us in an even greater way. I want to look at an example in Scripture. Turn to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. So if you're in Acts, just flip two more, two more books over. Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And what this is going to show us is that, that God crushes our self-dependence and He wants us to rely on Him. He wants us to rely on Him. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me, there it is again, from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Let me read that again. Power is perfected in weakness. And then he goes on. He says, Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with my weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. And then he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This seems like Paul's excited here, doesn't it? Whenever he learns, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have to be strong on my own. I can just rest. 
I can rest in the, in the sovereignty of God, in the strength of God. I don't have to muster it up for myself, from within me, but I just rely on Him. I depend on Him. I'm weak, and God is strong, and through that I find strength, right? That's what God's saying here, right? What is God saying? He's saying, this is a pride killer, right? This is a pride killer. Pride wants us to be strong on our own, but we're called to dependency on God, on the Lord, to do anything to accomplish His work in the world that we live in. So dependency in the right kind of way can only be accomplished through one thing, and that's through humility. The humility, because everything in us wants to keep doing things on our own strength, right? To be self-reliant, to be capable of things. But that's the flesh. That's the flesh that's talking. That's the world that's always barking at you to say, no, you need to be self-reliant, self-dependent, right? But Scripture comes along and it says, no, no. We are to be weak. We are to understand that we're weak, right? And to be strong on Him, to be weak in ourselves, but strong in Him. That's what Paul says. He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the strongest call to humility I can think of. This is a call to rest in the right kind of way, to rest in Christ and to know that the battle is His the battle is God's, and He's the one that gives us strength to put our, our armor on and then to go out the door and go to battle, right? Because we rest in His strength. We understand that I am weak, but He is strong. We understand that I am dependent, right? But He's our refuge. He's who we rely on. We understand I'm not capable on my own strength, but I'm His soldier, Right, And he's the one that gives me the strength to go out the door and to continue fighting in this battle. He's the one that's capable, and I belong to him. That's one of the things that Paul is trying to teach us here in this passage, I believe. It may seem upside down, though, right? It seems upside down, especially to the philosophy of the world. Many things are upside down, according to the philosophy of the world, kind of like Jesus, whenever he says in Mark 9.35, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. So if you want to be strong, you need to be weak. And if you want to be first, you need to be last. This is not the wisdom of the world. But that's because God knows who we are. That our nature is prideful and that we're really absolutely nothing without him. We're nothing without him. I, in my mind, I imagine you know, looking through a microscope at, at a dirt mite, right? And we see this little dirt mite under a microscope, and he's proclaiming how powerful and mighty and impressive that he is, how important that he is. And that's the way that I often think that maybe God should see us, but that's not the way that he sees us. He loves us, right? He sees us as that four-year-old child with a wrench in our hand in the garage, just wanting to get involved in the work, just wanting to get involved in his kingdom because he loves us. But because God loves us and he wants us to be part of his family, he teaches us how to be godly people. He teaches us how to be holy people. And he teaches us how to be humble people. And he does that by teaching us dependency and reliance on him because that's the best thing that that it's possibly he could do for us, right? To show us who we are and who he is. And he does that through his grace, through his grace. Notice in verse three, it says, they were testifying to the word of his grace. Now what's grace? Grace is unmerited, undeserved, or unearned favor. And that's something worth testifying for, right? That's, that's something that we should testify about, that God is giving us something that we do not deserve by His amazing grace. He's given us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Scripture tells us that we're still going to be learning about that. We're still going to be learning about God's amazing grace for all of eternity. Uh, flip over to Ephesians real quick. I want to show you something. It says... Um, and this is going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, 7 through 8. 
And what this is going to show us is that we're going to be uncovering God's grace for all of eternity. For all of eternity. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 7, it says, So that in the ages to come, you should underline that, right? In the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now this speaks about the, the ages to come, the ages to come. That's a long time. I looked it up. How long's an age? And when I looked it up, it said that an age is over a hundred years. And this is plural. This is used in the plural sense, right? It's the S at the end. So this is talking about hundreds of years. Really what this is talking about is eternity. It's talking about for all of eternity. You know, I think, you know, some, we're all going to be sitting around in heaven a thousand years from now. And somebody's going to say, yeah, you know, I think I finally understand God's grace. And then God's just going to say, you've only scratched the surface. Let me show you more. Let me show you more. God just show, he showers the believer over and over again with his grace until we cry out, we're not worthy. Right? We're not worthy of this. Then he showers us with more until we fall on our knees and we worship him and we glorify him for all it is that he's done for us. Over and over and over again, God gives us his grace, us, the undeserving, the people that do not deserve that. He showers us with this over and and over again. And that's something, again, that humbles us. We've been talking about humility a lot today, haven't we? It's something that should humble us, that God loves us that much, that gives us amazing grace. Augustine, I got a quote here from him. He says, Nothing whatsoever pertaining to godliness and real holiness can be accomplished without grace. So what he's saying here, what Augustine says is, you know, we can't do anything whatsoever without grace. Nothing. We can't be saved without God's grace. We can't grow in holiness without God's grace giving us that ability. We can't grow in our gifts that he's given us without God's grace empowering us to do that and to go out and to do these things. We can't evangelize. We can't teach. We can't preach. We can't witness. We, we can't be humble. We can't be discerning. We can't be faithful. We can't walk in the fruit of the Spirit. The list goes on and on. We can do nothing whatsoever without God's grace. You see, church, God is always the hero. I'll say that again. God is always the hero. Always. We can do nothing apart from Him. And God's to be glorified even in what we think that we're accomplishing for Him, right? Because he is the hero. He's the one that's giving us the grace to do that. Because really, we accomplish nothing apart from him. But it's him working through us. Right? It's him working through us. Now it says here that God granted them the ability to do signs and wonders. Now why is that? Why do you think that is? Was it so that the people who were gathered would come to faith in Christ? The answer is no. People don't come to faith in Christ because of miracles, because of signs and wonders. If you remember Jesus' ministry, all the things that he did, and the thousands of people that were following him. And then at the end, after he was crucified, how many were left? 120, right? 120. So we can see that signs and wonders isn't why that that's not what they were doing to try to get people to be converted, right? These signs and wonders were granted to them so that people would understand by whose authority that they were making their claims. So if you remember, there was a lot of false teachers that were running around at the time. Uh, just like there's a lot of, of false teachers that's running around today, but during this time there wasn't any New Testament that people could open up to see, you know, what is, is, is what they're proclaiming true? It's what they're proclaiming, actually God's word, right? So that what happens here is that God grants them this ability to do signs and wonders to show that these, these people that were speaking 
in the midst of all the other people speaking, these guys are the ones who are speaking the truth, right? Who do you listen to when you have five people telling you five different things? You listen to the guy that's doing signs and wonders, right? Because you have no New Testament to open up and compare what it is that they are saying. So they were the voice of God during this time because the canon of Scripture had not been completed. And something else we should see here, too, is is they preached first, right? They came in and they preached first and then God gave them the ability to do signs and wonders to show that the grace that they were preaching about was indeed grace. But today, now, we have a completed canon of Scripture and we have a sufficient canon of Scripture that God has blessed us with. So, I hate to say this, but after the service today, I'm not going to do signs and wonders. You know, I... I'm not going to do it because you can open up your Bible and you can see it's what he's saying true and you should you shouldn't just take my word for it right you should open up your Bible and make sure that what I'm saying is true but during this time they had absolutely no way to authenticate that message and so God was showing them signs and wonders you know, one of the things that I think is sad is that there's a lot of people today that go to, to church because they just want to see something miraculous, because they want to be entertained. They want to, they want to see a show. They don't want to hear the preaching. They don't want to hear the gospel proclaimed. They want to see something supernatural, but they, they don't want to be bothered by this preaching stuff and all this gospel stuff, right? That stuff's boring, right? No. No. Not for the believer. We talked last week about how that we are all designed in a way to where we need it to be refreshed. And that Scripture does that. Christ does that. He refreshes our spirits through the preaching of the Word of God. That's the, that's the highlight of, of the service, right? It's when the truth is proclaimed to you. We don't come to church to be entertained. We don't come to church for all those things. We come to church to hear the truth, to hear the truth, right? Let's look at verse 4. It says, but the people of the city were divided. That's what happens. When the truth's proclaimed, people are divided, right? But the, the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews, and some sided with the apostles. I mean, really what we're dealing with here is a church split, right? You got to remember, this is a, a highly religious culture. Everybody was religious during this time. So um, this is a church split. But in this case, it was a good church split. You know, sometimes there are good church splits. We think of the Reformation because the apostasy of the Roman Catholic Church, right? And so the Reformation comes and it says, no, we're going to we're going to have a church split, right? We're going to become Protestants. Protestants are going to break away from the Roman Catholic Church because of all the apostasy and all the things that had come in during that time. So there's a such thing as a good church split, but there's also a bad church split. And that's why that I brought up earlier that we don't argue and fuss and fight and disagree about petty things, right? Or even against our elders and leaders, as long as our elders and leaders are glorifying God in their decisions, right? But the city here was divided. And some sided with the Jews, and then some sided with the apostles, right? And so what was going on is the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was being built. Being built. That's the story of Acts, right? And it's still being built today. Jesus Christ is building his church in the gates of hell will never prevail against it, right? Today we're a part of that. We're a part of Jesus Christ and His amazing work in building the church. And we get, we get to witness that and be a part of that and be humbled by that. It's amazing. But when the, when the gospel is proclaimed, as we can see in our text here, there's division. There's division. There's some people who accept it, and there's some people who reject it. And those who reject the gospel, they often do it in, har in very harmful ways, or awful ways. That's why all throughout church history, we're, we're filled and, bo and bombarded with story after story of all the awful things that were done to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Terrible things. Uh, I'm sure that many things come to your mind that's happened to our brothers and sisters throughout church history, but also even today. Even today. 
But Jesus is building his church. Jesus is building his church. And Satan's trying to stop it. But he can't. And he never will. Let's look at 5, 6, and 7. It says, And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Laconia, Lystra, and Derbe, and the surrounding regions. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So once again, they got ran out of town, right? We see that once again, but God was sovereignly protecting them because he wasn't finished with them yet, right? When a, when a believer, when God's finished with the believer, then we just get a promotion, right? We just get a promotion. But their time for promotion had not come yet. So persecution always comes before growth, right? That's one of the things that always happened in the early church is persecution and then growth. The gospel is proclaimed. Some believed, some didn't. And the ones who, who didn't, they became angry, they became bitter, and they persecuted them. But what happened later on? Later on, we get the book of Galatians, right? These churches were planted. God was building his church. Later on, Paul's writing letters to these churches that was planted, the ones that tried to kill him, that ran him out of town. God was still building his church. Satan was trying to stop it. But Satan has no power whatsoever outside of what it is that God allows him to do. Right? We need to remember that we all have a mission. And until God is done with us, we stay in the fight, right? Until we get our promotion and we can rest in the arms of God. But it wasn't time for Paul and Barnabas promotion yet because God sovereignly made them aware that they were in danger, that it was time to go. And he may have done that through supernatural means. It doesn't really say. It may, it may have been other people that came and warned them, hey, they're getting ready to stone you, right? Because God sometimes, he, he sometimes works quietly. And sometimes he uses other people to come to your life and to warn you about something. And we don't know what happened, but God was sovereignly in control of this situation, right? So they fled to Laconia. They fled to the cities of Lystra, Derby, and the surrounding regions. So this region, the region of Galatia, they went out and they continued to proclaim the gospel. Now what is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that your sins can be forgiven. In order to understand the gospel in, in a, a better way, the good news, then we should understand the bad news first, right? Because that just makes the gospel even more attractive, right? It's like that diamond on the, on the, the black piece of velvet, right? You've got to have that, that black, dark background to really see the, the beauty of the gospel. And the bad news is that God is holy and God is just. And therefore, every sin that's ever committed has to be punished. Scripture says that the wages of sin is, is death. Scripture calls this the second death. The reason it's called the second death is because it's eternal. It's in a place that's reserved for Satan and for his demons. It's an eternal place. We talked about that a few, a few weeks ago. That's one of the things that people keep trying to rip out of the Bible. That hell's just uh, temporary, right? It's not. It's eternal. That's the bad news. But the good news is that God sent His Son, right? He sent Jesus Christ into the world to pay for your sins if you believe in Him. And He did that by taking on the nature of man, by living a perfect life, and then going to the cross to pay for your sins, to pay for the sins of anyone who would believe. And that's through faith. Through faith, your, your sins are imputed to Christ whenever he was on the cross. And all of his righteousness, all of his holiness, was all imputed to you if you believe in him. That's the good news, right? Our sins are forgiven. They're covered by the blood of Christ. We no longer have to stand before God and be guilty. We don't have to be punished for the things that we deserve. That's why we talked about God's grace so much today, right? And being humbled by that and how it's such an important thing to do. So if you know him, then you should thank him, right? 
thank him for what it is that he's done for you. Give him praise. Give him glory. Worship him for his grace that he's, that he's showered us with. We're getting ready to sing again. And we're going to sing about, about some of these things. And just think, about, just think about that as you sing to God this morning. If you don't know him, then today's the day. Repent and believe in him, right? And be adopted into his eternal family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're